in the case of the mind, especially in the case of conscious states, those features do not in any way seem to be explained either by the neurological goings on or by the computational or representational structure of what's going on. They seem to be really something over and above that. Inability to figure out how you could give a physical or functional explanation is what I introduced this term, the explanatory gap, to cover. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Joseph Levine. I'm a professor of philosophy at the uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I've been in this field for over 40 years now. Um, what else would you like to know? I'm not sure what else you want. Uh... No, that's more than fine, Dr. Levine. Uh, all right, so should we start with our first? Okay, so our first question deals with um, our first question deals with the philosophy of mind. So we wanted to discuss philosophy of mind with you, um, and especially you being critical of identity theory. Can you, first of all, give a brief introduction of the key criticisms you've raised um, and uh, kind of an overview of the explanatory gap problem that has been described as a precursor to the probably more well-known um, hard problem of consciousness? Okay, yes. Um, actually, yeah, they're a very close connection. Um, so there's a, a there's a you know ongoing debate in philosophy going way back but the modern version of it obviously beginning with descartes which is just what's called the mind body problem how how are our mental phenomena how is mental life uh related to the physical goings on in the body and of course now we know it's the brain and um uh it you know nobody denies there's uh uh, obviously a very tight connection. If you take out parts of your brain, you're not going to think or see or hear. So we know that in some sense, what's going on in the brain is determining what's going on in your mental life. But the question that philosophers have worried about, let's think of this as a metaphysical question, is are these really two separate kinds of phenomena that are just sort of causally interacting with each other? Or is in some sense the mind reducible? to the body or mental activity reducible to brain activity of some kind. And uh, the materialist position, which has been dominant in at least analytic philosophy of mind, Anglo-American philosophy of mind for the last century, um, the materialist position is that, there, that some kind of reduction of the mental to the physical is possible. And in fact, has to be the case. And one of the reasons they think it has to be the case is that uh, um, we know that what happens in the physical world always has a physical explanation. If you want to know why something moved from point A to point B, there's going to be some physical force that's responsible for that. So since we know the mind can make the body move, therefore it looks like uh, it has to itself be something, so a physical phenomenon. The problem is that, uh, and by the way, so when you say the identity theory, often as a proper name, a name for a particular version of materialism, which was popular uh, in the 60s, which claimed that a, a mental state, like a pain or a belief or a, anything you might think of as a state of the mind, is somehow exactly the same state as being in a certain neurological state of the brain. That's probably, that's undoubtedly a stronger thesis than most materialists believe nowadays because they want to allow the possibility of what's called multiple realizability, that you can um, have uh, different kinds of physical devices, uh, like Data and Star Trek might have a mind, looks like he does, uh, um, and yet he's made out of electronics. So people want to allow that possibility so um, the position called functionalism has been introduced to say that you have a more abstract, informational kind of computational kind of description of what a mental state is. And then that gets embodied or realized in uh, the brain or in electronics or, or some other way. My objection to that originally was not 
meant to be an argument to show that the doctrine of materialism was false, but rather to just to bring up a serious problem. And that is in all other domains, when we discover what something is, like when we discover what water is, we discover it's H2O, that explains all the phenomena that we have associated with water. So you want to know why water freezes at uh, at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, why it boils at 212 uh, Fahrenheit, why it uh, is um, relatively colorless, all, all of the things that are the standard features we associate with water, you can explain that by saying, well, because it's made up of these molecules and given the laws of chemistry and physics, you can expect the behavior that, you're, that you find in water. Um, in the case of the mind, especially in the case of conscious states that have to do with what it's like for us, how, how our experience feels to us, those features do not in any way seem to be explained either by the neurological goings on or by the computational or representational structure of what's going on. They seem to be really something over and above that. And this inability to figure out how you could give a physical or functional explanation of what's sometimes called the qualitative character of experience is what I... Uh, uh, introduce this term, the explanatory gap, um, to cover. Now, does that show that the mind isn't reducible in this way to physical goings-on? Maybe not, but it shows there's still something very strange going on. If it, it is reducible, you would expect this explanatory gap to be something that we could um, close. And so far, nobody, as far as I can tell, has had a good idea how we could close it. So that's the end of my answer. Uh, yes, uh, wonderful. So <clears throat> now a little bit still before we get to like the more specialized questions that any of you had, um, we still want to cover a little bit of a trivial ground, which might be boring to you, but it's important for us. So a couple of comments on how your theory would uh, either help or revive any form of, let's say, uh, substance dualism. Uh, are you at all sympathetic to it, or do you believe it's dead in the water? And secondly, and this is, I guess, something that was on our minds recently, uh, any thoughts on property dualism? Uh, how popular is it in the field? Do you think that uh, it's better suited at answering some of these objections than identity theory? If so, why? Uh, and the third one that uh, people wanted to ask was, you mentioned that you watched uh, your, you watched our interview with Bill Grammy, you know him. What are your thoughts about his views on the philosophy of mind? Are you sympathetic? So, I mean, those three questions are the ones that were asked. Thank you. Uh, actually, I didn't watch the whole interview. I just saw the beginning of it. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I know Akhil, but uh, I don't actually know his particular views that well that I, I do not feel in a, in a position to comment on those. But as far as your first two questions are concerned, um, so I should say, as a background to those two questions, that um, when I said that I, I wasn't originally arguing against the doctrine of materialism itself, but as it were, pointing out a real problem with it, I've, I've more recently come around to saying I think materialism must be false. And the reason is that it seems to me that um, I don't know what a good materialist explanation of our of this explanatory gap could be other than the fact that we really are dealing with two distinct um, kinds of phenomena now. So two distinct kinds of phenomena um, seems to indicate uh, suggest the term dualism. And traditionally, of course, the, the dualism that we all uh, learn about in our first philosophy class is Cartesian dualism from Descartes, where it really is a form of what uh, your questioner asked, uh, is a form of substance dualism. The idea that there are two kinds of substance in the world, there's matter, which Descartes thought its main um, principal attribute was extension, but, you know, we can basically, we can think of that as characterized by whatever the most recent physics tells us is the correct characterization of matter or the material world. And then there was mind, which was a different kind of thing, a different kind of substance, and it had its main um, uh, attribute was thought. Now, I am not, uh, I don't see any good reason 
to believe in substance dualism. I don't think any any of the arguments against materialism push you in the direction of of uh, substance dualism. Um, so therefore, I, and I'm not attracted to it. And I suppose this partly comes from a kind of principle of parsimony. It seems to me that given what we know about the world today, given what science has taught us about um, the ways in which almost every phenomenon we know about is governed by the laws of physics, materialism is kind of the default option. You have to have reasons to be dissatisfied with it, to push you to be what you might call more metaphysically um, robust and go beyond materialism. I think of property dualism as going less far beyond uh, materialism than substance dualism does. And so since I think materialism is, as it were, the default position, um, I don't want to go any farther than the arguments push me. So therefore, I'm much more inclined towards something like property dualism than I am toward um, substance dualism. The difference between them is that substance dualism basically says there's there's an entity that is non-spatial, though it, it is temporal, um, which is the bearer of mental properties. There's this thing, a soul, which has your thoughts and feelings, and then it's constantly in causal interaction with your body. Now, if it's not spatial, how is it associated with one body rather than another? That's a real problem, I think, for substance dualists. I, I think um, uh, Jaguan Kim actually has a really good article where he brings up just how, how difficult that problem is. But property dualism says, no, no, they're, they're, the only things in the world are things that have physical properties. They are physical things. To be a physical thing just is to be something that has physical properties like spatial extension, matter, mass, what it, you know, whatever physics tells us are the basic physical properties that things have. But it adds there are certain features, certain properties of these things that are not themselves um, reducible to the physical properties of the thing. So to give you an example of the kind of reduction that is possible, that this, this is being denied here, take the computational states of a computer. So a computer, a physical thing, has both electronic properties, you know, some electronic uh, um, uh, features and processes are going on all the time. It also has computational processes. It's carrying out an instruction. It's carrying out an inference. It's carrying out a calculation. These are distinct properties. However, one can show and explain how it is that the computational properties are embodied in the machine by reference to its electronic properties. If you had that kind of relation for things like feelings of pain or the uh, qualitative experience of seeing a red rose, then we'd be done, then fine. Then the world would be safe for materialism. The problem is a process, a, a connection like the kind that you can show between the computational states of a computer and its electronics does not seem possible for the qualitative conscious states uh, of a mind and the brain hardware or wetware, as they sometimes say. So therefore, there's some reason to think, no, we've got a new kind of property here, and it's only, it's related to the physical one, but not by this um, uh, relation of realization or embodiment. And that's what means that we've added something metaphysically that we didn't have before. All right, wonderful. So uh, Dog had a voice question, and uh, then there's a couple of other text questions. Uh, yes, hello. Um, can you guys hear my mic well? I can hear you. Uh, yes. Now uh, I can't hear you. Okay. Yeah, so I had two questions. The first question is, how do you think that something like hylomorphism, right, the theory of um, form and matter, might fit into your view of the mind? And the second question is, um, 
Uh, do you think that things like intentional states or beliefs or conceptual schemes would be more fundamental relative to things like qualia or equally fundamental? Or do you think that qualia would be more fundamental than things like beliefs and concepts? And uh, do you think all of these would be equally fundamental or less fundamental than um, like matter, you know, dispositional properties? that science studies. Okay. Um, I am not that familiar with the hylomorphism um, uh, topic. Um, I know it's been revived recently. In fact, I would know even less about it, but actually it just turns out I've just had a very recently finished PhD student who just got his doctorate, um, uh, a Chinese man named Hao Ying, Lu, who just went back to China, um, who wrote his dissertation on uh, on actually panpsychism, which I, I imagine will come up somehow in this conversation. And uh, he had a whole chapter on hylomorphism, so I learned something about it. And uh, I won't tell you what he said about it, but generally my impression um, from uh, my interactions there was that the form matter distinction isn't going to really do any work that I can see that would help here. Now, of course, in order to make that case, I'd have to actually. So sometimes people want to con... want to analogize or draw an analogy between sort of form and the and the mental and matter and the body, but that's a not. I mean, there's a kind of nice metaphorical kind of analogy there. Now the question is, so really, what are you saying? You know, I have never seen, and, and again, the, in this chapter in his thesis, he went through quite a few um, uh, uh, quotes from people. Nothing ever really made sense to say, yes, this is actually going to explain what this relation is. Everything always seemed on the level of metaphor, as far as I'm concerned. So therefore, I, I, I'm just not at all, um, uh, oh, I see, I just got text. But anyway, um, uh, uh, so I'm not sure what it adds. It, it, to me, it, it just, um, I think it's a bit obfuscating, actually. As far as the question, sure. about, fundamental, as far as the question about fundamentality goes, of course, it depends what you mean by the word fundamental. Um, so. If you if you're thinking metaphysically, and if you're thinking about, um, I, I in my own work have made an important distinction between what I call basic properties and basic laws, and I'm I use the word basic and fundamental interchangeably, so I can call them fundamental properties and fundamental laws, and properties that are realized in other properties. So that's what I meant about the case of the uh, computer. The computer's computational states are not fundamental states in the sense that they are instantiated in the computer by virtue of being of the electronic states being instantiated. Once you've got the correct, the right kinds of electronic states instantiated, you automatically have the other states instantiated. So the one happens by virtue of, metaphysically that is, by virtue of the other. A fundamental property or state is one that is not realized through other properties or states. So, for instance, in physics, at some level, unless one has a view that somehow uh, things keep descending forever, it's turtles all the way down or something. Um, but as, assuming you think, no, no, there are some fundamental properties in the world. Maybe they're the properties of quarks. Maybe they're the properties of fields of space. I mean, who knows? I'm not a physicist. But whatever those properties are, they are instantiated in the world, not by virtue of something else being instantiated. No, they provide the basic furniture building blocks out of which all other property instantiate, instantiations are constructed. So, it's, it makes sense to distinguish properties that are fundamental or basic in this sense from properties that are not. Now, my view is that phenomenal properties, property or like you called qualia and the like, are, are fundamental. 
and they're not realized by physical state. Other states, they're fundamental. Now, the question is, are intentional states fundamental? I take that to be what you were also asking. And what is their uh, sort of relative status with the phenomenal states? And um, I take a, a kind of um, almost ambiguous line, or I, I, I like to divide the intentional into two spheres. I actually think there is a kind of phenomenal intentionality. That is, I do think all phenomenal states have some inherent intentionality in them. They all have an aboutness, right? When you, when you feel something or see something or experience something, there's an act-object kind of relation. There's the thing experienced and the experiencing of it. I think there's a, it's very hard to understand exactly how that, how, how that structure works, but that's all within the realm of the phenomenal. And that's a kind of phenomenal intentionality that I am um, happy to um, acknowledge. However, I also think there's a kind of phenomenal, uh, not phenomenology, excuse me, intentionality that applies to the processes that cognitive science studies, the representation, the computational procedures that go on in your visual systems, say, to uh, figure out depth, color, relations, whatever, you know, the 3D layout in space that you get, that your, your visual system computes from the, from the light that hits the retina. And it seems to me that for that science to make sense, it has to posit mental representations. And these representations have to be about things. But I think this has nothing to do with phenomenal intentionality. This kind of intentionality actually, um, and a lot of it would go for rational states of uh, your, you know, your intelligence system. So I'm not just peripheral like perception, but things like belief and desire and whatever gets you to act in the world. Um, and I think those things have to have an intentionality that actually is not fundamental, that somehow is realized by the physical interactions both within the brain and between the brain and the world. So I kind of divide the intentional into these two, and I don't think one actually can be understood in terms of the other. Uh, I see. Um, so, like for example, in the case of a proposition, right, when somebody has a propositional attitude or a belief, um, in that case, what do you think is the relevance of their experiential uh, states, their quality, uh, as well as things like their memories, right, their experiences of remembering certain qualia to the actual um, proposition, right, the actual propositional content? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, um, this sounds like um, a question about a topic that's become very popular uh, known as cognitive phenomenology. And um, uh, my view about that is that when it comes to the actual content of your uh, propositional attitude states, that that is not a function of the phenomenology at all. Um, so I would assume that that, uh, um, and, you know, I mean, when most of our propositional attitude states are unconscious at any one time, we're conscious of very few of them, right? Um, we're constantly uh, figuring out how to interact with the world using what are undoubtedly propositional attitude states. That is informational states that that um, express an attitude in some way or other toward the truth or falsity of some proposition, and um, most of that goes on well beneath the area of conscious experience. And it seems to me that the beliefs we're conscious of have to be pretty much of the same kind of state as the states that we're not conscious of, because they all interact to, to, to get us to act in the world in the same way. They're all interacting together, right, to mediate between the stimuli that we are sensitive to and the behavior that we end up performing. 
Um, and therefore, I actually think of the consciousness of those states as rather epiphenomenal for their um, actual functioning. And I don't think the phenomenal character that is associated with consciously believing or thinking or any of those uh, conceptual activities, I don't think that the phenomenal character of those has any really determinate relation to their um, propositional content. I see. Um, my my other question um, was also in regards to uh, whether you've um, whether you've interacted with Ed Fazer and his argument against materialism. Um, I, I actually, I, I don't believe Ed Fazer originally came up with this. Um, I forgot the name of the person who did. Uh, the argument basically um, goes like this. Um, things like conceptual frameworks, concepts, intentional states are uh, determinate, right? They have a determined meaning. Um, whereas in the case of, um, um, matter, right, uh, physical states, um, it's not going to be clear what rule they're, they're following, right? So like if you have a machine that, um, adds, uh, one to every natural number, you know, you don't know whether, you know, after, after the number 1 million, whether it's going to add two to them, right? So the idea is that for any physical state, it's not clear. It's not clear what meaning it has, right? So, the argument basically goes: if this is the case, how can it? How can our intentional states, which do have a determinate meaning, reduce to physical states that don't? Right? How can physical states realize intentional states? Yeah. Um, well, so there are two ways. Um, yes, I think I, I. I don't know the name of the person you just mentioned, but. Um, but actually, Terry Horgan, in an article on um, phenomenal intentionality, I mean, he's written several, and I can't remember the precise one, but it seems to me he makes a similar argument. Uh, uh, that is, one reason to think phenomenal intentionality has to, has to be the basis of all intentionality is that otherwise you would suffer an indeterminacy problem, which sounds like what you're, what you're telling me the, this yeah. argument is. So. Um, so I would come at that from two sides. One is, well, actually, before that, one is to acknowledge something that I think um, is recently materialists have sort of, some of them have forgotten, which is there was a period, especially in the late 80s, early uh, the 90s, and then maybe right into the, the f first few years of the new century, when the real hot topic in philosophy of mind was how to naturalize intentionality. And there were all these raging debates. There was Ruth Milliken, Jerry Fodor, Fred Dretzky, and people had causal informational analyses, tracking representationalism, which is a version of that. There were teleological theories that involve um, appeal to natural selection. And one thing that, of course, happen i mean that literature it's not like it's over but it did sort of peter out as far as i can tell um and it's not that it petered out because people solved the problem it petered out because i think what happened is nobody had any new ideas and every other idea had been shot down so um and a lot of this does have to do with the indeterminacy issue uh, according to Fodor, it was called the disjunction problem and which is maybe slightly different from the uh, from the kind of problem you're talking about. When you were talking about the adding machine, it makes me think of Kripke's. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Redoing yeah. of Wittgenstein and the Quest Plus. So in all those cases, um, so I, I don't want to make it sound as if yeah, we 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 know what the materialist uh, uh, naturalization analysis is, and we're happy with it. No, in fact, we don't have one that obviously works and isn't subject to serious counterexamples. So in that sense, the jury is out on the naturalizability of intentionality. If it turns out there isn't any way to do that, then I don't know. I mean, I don't know what you say. I don't know what you say about cognitive science then. Um, what most people seem to think is, well, 
maybe we haven't figured it out, but there's some such theory. Now, one question is, and of course, until until we've surveyed all the theories, right? You never know for sure that you haven't gotten one that actually will survive all the uh, objections. Now, what Kripke and some other people did is try to come up with an in-principle objection to that. Oh, not just a way of saying nobody's yet come up, you know, no version of Milliken or Fodor or Dretzky or, or any of those people. You know, it's one thing to say none of those versions really work. It's another thing to come up with an in-principle argument that no such version could work. And that's what the Kripken, as they call it, Krippenstein, right, argument was supposed to do. It was supposed to show there's no way that appeal to physical processes could ever determine a determinant meaning for, um, uh, um, for a, well, he, he was talking mostly about words, but it could be for a mental representation. And that I was not convinced by. Um, and in fact, it struck me that Jerry Fodor did have a very good answer to that in his, um, and it just so happens I just taught this recently, so it's on my mind. Um, but in his uh, two-part, very long piece called A Theory of Content, in the second part, he has a, like a three-page discussion of um, the Krippenstein argument. And uh, this will, I mean, to flesh this out will take some time, so I'm not going to go into it in detail. But he basically argues that the flaw in that kind of argument is that it assumes that counterfactuals are the basic notion and laws are to be analyzed in terms of counterfactuals. And then Kripke, of course, shows there are no counterfactuals that we could either know or appeal to that would ever determine that a certain person or a certain device uh, means plus rather than quas, which was his example. And Fodor's argument is, well, that's because yeah, counterfactuals is not what's basic here. It's the laws themselves. You have to posit there are certain lawful relations. What distinguishes a law from other kinds of generalizations is it supports counterfactuals. You don't analyze what it is to be a law in terms of counterfactuals. So the answer to Kripke is there is the appropriate lawful relation between well, it's a little hard to see how you do it in mathematics, by the way, but between certain um, real world situations and the representation, and it's by virtue of that relation that the representation means the thing in the world. Now, as I said, nobody's yet characterized what that lawful relation is like, you know, what conditions it has to be subject to in a way that is not subject to serious counterexamples. But I don't think Kripke or anyone else has shown that in principle it can't be done. I see. All right. Yeah. Okay. So um, I guess this is a repeat question. Uh, okay. So I guess this is a repeat question, but somebody wants to say, um, could you please, uh, I apologize for repeating myself, but could you please uh, articulate your position uh, on property dualism and um, how... Um, popular it is in today's philosophy. Oh, well, um, so uh, pro again, uh, so, uh, you don't need me to say what property dualism is, right? We did that uh, earlier, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm probably, I mean, for reasons that I'm not sure I can totally articulate right now, I'm not happy with calling myself a dualist. <laughs> I somehow think that the entire met framework of the discussions about dualism or monism or something are somehow off the track, but I'm, I've yet to figure out exactly what, how to say why I, I feel that way. And uh, it's something I've been thinking about recently and trying to work on. But to at least... Um, a first approximation, I would count myself a property dualist, right? So in terms of, you know, if you're kind of looking up the camps of, you know, what camps various philosophers of mine fall into, and if you put up a property dualism as one of the positions, and substance dualism is another, and physicalist monism is another, and I think I fall pretty easily into the property dualism camp. How popular is it? I certainly can't give you um, anything like percentages, but I can say this, that it's much more popular now, I think, than it was 
20 years ago uh, or 30 years. I actually, time keeps flying. Maybe it's 30 years ago now. Um, and that's largely, I mean, you know, because a number of philosophers have been developing objections to materialism. Um, I, I like to think I contributed to that. Certainly David Chalmers's work and a lot of the work that's responded to him has contributed to that. It, it seems to me that, um, that whereas when I started out, so I was in graduate school uh, in the late 70s, it seems to me then there were very few people who were any sort of dualist at all. And now that strikes me as it's actually pretty common. Is it a majority or a minority? I bet it's still a minority, but it's it's a significant, well-represented minority. If it is a minority, and again, I haven't done a survey. Um, actually, Chalmers probably has. You know, the his Phil Papers thing sometimes does these surveys, and um, but but the main thing is, is it's certainly in the air in a way and not considered a, a kind of odd or deviant position the way it was when I was first uh, in graduate school. All right, wonderful. Um, so, just a second. All right, good. So, uh, a couple of other questions, but I guess the one that I wanted to ask on Mike was based cosmopolitan. So, go ahead, cosmopolitan. Um, so, this is slightly convoluted, but it kind of relates to the property dualism um, thought and to what you said earlier about sort of materialism uh, being, you know, sort of seem, seeming false. So, I guess um, I'm wondering f first off, what in your view, what in your view, in your view, is, view is happy to distinguish between property dualism and the kind of broad cluster of views that uh, uh, we might call non reductive physicalism, so non, non reductive. Uh, and if we're if we're pushed away from you know, identity theory, reductive physicalisms, uh, materialisms by um, the explanatory gap or related argument, um, is, is it perhaps sufficient to not kind of go all the way? You know, not to say, oh, I'm going to be a property dualist. You might want to say that, but uh, is, it, is it possible to maybe sort of uh, think in terms of some sort of like grounding based non reductive physicalism um, where you've got um some grounding but you know a, a complete rejection of identity for for instance or do you think that would just be property dualism by another name so i, I feel like that was a bit of a ramble but uh yeah hopefully that's uh cogent yeah i think i know what, yeah, you're, talking I know what and, you're talking about oh all of a sudden i'm get, hearing an echo no i went away okay um uh so the phrase non-reductive materialism or non-reductive physicalism has been around a long time. It seems to me it was popular in, in when I was in graduate school already, um, though the word grounding is a more, much more recent um, uh, terminological introduction. Um, and it used, I think it used to mean, I mean, part of the problem is, is what, what's not, what does the non-reductive part mean? And I actually think it's ambiguous. I think there's a, 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 a meaning that has been an interpretation that has been associated with the term non-reductive and non-reductive materialism that really is um, would still count as reductive in my broad sense. And that is that when functionalism first came in, uh, in the 60s and 70s, and people were really trying to, because of the multiple realizability arguments, because of the problem about couldn't a computer be intelligent and have a mind and robots and Martians and all this stuff, not to mention different animals um, uh, uh, here on Earth. Um, people wanted to reject what was called the identity theory. But as I say, it's a very specific identity theory. It's the identity of brain states and mental states. And that was the position that what sometimes got called type reductionism. That was the position that was called the reductive position. And in fact, in one of the Jerry Fodor's famous articles, the special sciences article, I think he, he specifically calls reductionism the view that he is going to oppose. But that reductionism was only a reductionism, was really, that was a sense of reduction that entailed an identity between a mental state and some particular physical configuration, whether it be neurology or any, anything else. And so therefore, functionalists who are, who are in fact 
talking about a higher level of abstraction and talking about functional states and functional properties, that was sometimes called a non-reductive physicalism. Why it's physicalist because the claim was all the functional states are realized by physical states, but it's non-reductive because there's no identity between the functional state and its realizer. That I'm I think of showing how a mental state could be realized by a physical state in a broad sense is a kind of reduction. In my in my sense, when I now some people do mean something more like property dualism by non-reductive materialism. Um, and why do they call it materialism then? Well, because the idea is, is that all objects and states have physical properties, they're all material. It's just they also have these uh, mental properties as well. Um, now, once grounding got into the conversation, again, I have not noticed there to be any real uniformity of use about the term grounding. My understanding of grounding, which I think is not, in fact, shared by all metaphysicians who talk about grounding, but my understanding of grounding is it really is just the same as realization. Um, it really That's really what they're getting at. By, if, if you say physical states ground mental states, that's no different than saying that they realize them. But if you mean something else, then then I need to know what you mean, and and, and whether it ends up being being like um, property dualism or not will depend very much on what the specific version of grounding you have in mind. Um, and I just a lot of the talk to me about this has been vague in very crucial places, and precisely those places you're sort of pointing to about whether. Are you really being a property dualist here? Or are you really being something more like a functionalist? Or are you being a panpsych? I mean, what are you being here? And I can't always tell when people talk about grounding what they mean. Yeah, just if I can briefly come back, if that's all right, I don't want to sure. take a lot of time. Sure. Um, so uh, I, I guess when I, and I think that very much is a sort of a typical um, view of grounding. The sort of thing I have in mind, I probably should have been explicit with it up front, is the sort of maybe... Al Wilson y metaphys metaphysical causation, say, where we're, uh, we seem very much to be rejecting anything like, uh, you know, uh, this is some, you know, realization by the back door sort of thing. Um, and, and what we, we, we're we more pointing to is a sort of um, depend dependence relation, I guess, but but not not typical. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I have a better way of cashing that out. Well, but, uh, well yeah, uh, sorry. Let, let me just say, uh, your your um, uh, your trouble with making that precise is, of course, exactly the problem. The problem is, I mean, and and in a way, look. To be fair, um, uh, and this, by the way, wasn't meant as a criticism of you, but of the of the the literature. Um, to be fair, when I said earlier, I wasn't sure I really liked being being um, uh, categorized as a dualist because there's there's something about that that makes me feel like what's really going on isn't getting captured, and I haven't yet figured out a good way to talk about what I think this relation is. Um, I'm in the same boat in a certain way then. In other words, I am trying to figure out, and I haven't seen in the literature anything that really I, I found helpful enough, a way of understanding the kind of metaphysical relation between um, the physical and, say, in the conscious and the phenomenal that does not is not straightforward realization the way it is with, say, functional states and computational states. But it's not the kind of ontological independence that um, that allows us to think there are possible worlds where everything is physically just like it is here, and yet there's no consciousness, right? So I'm searching for something in between, and maybe what you're asking is, well, am I in the camp of these people who are looking for something like that in between? And in that sense, maybe that's, maybe I am, but I, it's not like I know of any formulation in terms of 
metaphysical causation or grounding or something that uh, I yet have felt happy with. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. Jess. All right. Okay, so uh, Dr. Levine, there's a couple of other questions, and um, before we get to voice ones, let's uh, get over the trivial ones again. So, um, theism or atheism? What's your stance on this, and uh, what position do you take, if any? I'm sorry, I I didn't quite hear you. What or what? Okay, sorry. So the question was uh, about theism and atheism dispute. Oh, I, I'm an atheist. Okay, and is am. there a reason? Anything? Yeah, go ahead. Is there a reason? Yeah, because there's no God. Uh, um, actually, so I don't know. I mean, this is not, I mean, we, we were talking about philosophy of mind, but um, I actually have a paper on this. And um, uh, my wife and colleague, Louise Anthony, um, uh, edited a volume uh, called Philosophers Without Gods. Uh, meditations on atheism in the secular life in which I contributed. And it's almost all, two-thirds of the volume are authors who grew up in very strong religious backgrounds and who now no longer have it. So I grew up a very Orthodox Jew. I went to rabbinical school. I studied Talmud when I was extremely young. And um, and then, you know, at around the age of 19 or 20 or so, I just gave it all up and became totally secular. Um, so I just, I, I am, uh, yeah, I am completely secular. I, I see basically no good reason to believe in God, actually. I mean, um, and in fact, if, if you were to ask me arguments, uh, the, the work I point to, which I just love, I think it's one of the greatest pieces of philosophical literature, is Hume's Dialogues on Natural Religion. I pretty much feel like he says it all there. Um, but, uh, and that I don't have a whole lot to add. Um, but yeah, I'm... And um, yeah, Jimmy also wanted to know, uh, what's your take on common arguments for God, cosmological arguments, uh, possibly ontological, or um, uh, the fine theory ones? Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I, I would have to go through them all and and remind myself of all the moves, but I just, I don't find any of them convincing. And also, you know, think about it, um, and it's something that actually Hume brings up too. Take, suppose you find an argument that supposedly establishes that uh, God exists, or, right? Then you have to ask yourself, well, wait, what have I just named by God? What am I talking about? So if, if I have, proved that there has to be a prime mover or something like that or an ultimate ground or whatever you want that's far from god right when i when i want to say god doesn't exist i mean anything that would be an object of worship that would be an intentional agent that acts in the world i mean the things that religion is about now, if we start taking away all of that stuff and we just end with something of, of, a, of a real abstract characterization, um, then I don't actually care. I mean, I, it doesn't seem to me to matter. Um, then it becomes a question for physicists to figure out. What's the ultimate cause of the Big Bang? I don't know. You know, if they want to call it God, I don't care. Um, but then it becomes a scientific question, and um, uh, and then it seems to me it has nothing to do with religion anymore. All right, uh, wonderful. So the next person that wanted to get on mic was Callisti. Callisti, why don't you go ahead? Um, hi, Dr. Levine. Um, so I think this is similar to what you've called before the non-exceptionalist response to the conceivability argument, um, oh, except wow. it more. <laughs> you're, you're in deep in the weeds there. Oh. No, I, I looked I looked some of your papers up for the AMA, so. Oh, okay. I, I wanted to prepare a bit. Um, but, okay, so, yeah, um, but I think it m more directly talks about the explanatory gap. Um, writers like Jonathan Schaffer have claimed that explanatory gaps are ubiquitous in nature, 
Um, he claims, for example, for various reasons of muriological metaphysics, um, that there's an explanatory gap between the properties and relations between hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms and the properties of water. Mm. Um, or for a more controversial example, between um, Everettian uh, quantum mechanics with wave function realism um, and the world of our experience and stuff like that. And that he endorses the use of grounding relations, which in your answer to Prof's question, you said uh, was, you said you were skeptical about, which is understandable. Um, but in general, what do you think of these kind of moves um, and these examples? Um, and do you think they're analogous to the um, relation between physical and um, phenomenal states? Or if they am um, or not, and if you do, um, do you think they um, give any give any uh, sorry? Do you think they give any comfort to the physicalist or the physicalist who might want to take on grounding relations or not? Yeah, um, I, yeah, I am familiar with uh, Jonathan's position, um, and though I haven't looked at it recently so i i'm i'm trying to um remind myself what what so there are two things i want to say um this may be seem a little tangential but i do think it's it's important for these purposes um i think often um debates about physicalism have gotten off on the wrong foot because Two issues have been have gotten confused or assimilated and not um, distinguished in the way they should. One question is the mind body problem. Another question is the the universality and the basicness of, of the physical. So sometimes when people talk about physicalism, the idea is supposed to be the physical determines everything, it determines the mental, it determines the moral, it determines, you know, that the basic physical parameters uh, 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 determine all the other, the biological, everything. And, um, and the, the opponent of physicalism in the philosophy of mind is supposed to be uh, uh, opposed to that thesis. And um, it seems to me, no, that th there, there are interesting questions or reductive questions that come up in lots and lots of different domains and in each of these domains you've got to characterize the uh uh the candidate for reduction and the candidate for what it's reduced to in different ways and there's a separate claim that the ultimate reducer of everything is the physical that's a that's another that's a different thesis and it's one that i'm actually not that interested in I'm, I'm not saying that it's not an interesting question. It's just not the one that I'm interested in philosophy of mind. It seems to me the question of philosophy of mind is, is the mental basic or not? Or is it um, uh, realized in the non-mental? And I don't give a damn what the non-mental turns out to be. It could be something that physics hasn't yet thought of. As long as it's non-mental, that's all that matters. right? I think we have a conception of the mental. It's phenomenal or intentional. Those are the two features that really make something mental. Similarly, in, in normative ethics, in metaethics, I think there's this uh, debate. Is the normative reducible to the non-normative or the descriptive? That's sometimes called naturalism in ethics. Well, it doesn't have to be physical. It just has to be non-normative. That's all that really matters. The rest is a problem about how all the non-normative stuff relates to each other, that's not the problem for ethics. Ethics just needs to know, is normativity basic or primitive in this world? So that's how I like to ask these questions. And then it seems to me, if it turns out that in the physical world, say, and I don't know enough, phys I don't know anywhere near as much physics as Schaffer knows, so I'm not going to use his examples, but if it ever turns out that, say, um, there's chemical phenomena that really cannot be explained in terms of the fundamental 
uh, uh, features of physics, then there might be a kind of a, uh, a basic emergence at, of the chemical over and above the physical. I have no position on that. I don't know enough science to know whether that's the case. If it is the case, it says nothing about this other problem I have, about whether the mental is primitive in nature, whether the mental is primitive in nature. Finding out that the chemical might be, is, is or isn't, doesn't make me feel better one way or the other about the mental. Now, what Jonathan seems to want to do for all these cases and is say, well, let's add a metaphysical principle. We'll actually add a metaphysical principle that takes you from the non-mental grounding to the mental. And what I want to know is what that metaphysical principle is if it isn't just equivalent to um, just, uh, well, I guess it's postulating a kind of metaphysical relation that I don't understand how we could ever be, I don't understand in the end what it would mean other than just saying that we find the two go together. I mean, it, it feels stipulative to me, right? Uh, literally stipulative. I'm sorry, I don't know if that was a, uh, as good an answer as you deserve for that question. Right. But. No, it, it was, I, I, thank you. I like that answer. All right, wonderful. So, um, Dr. Levine, uh, thank you so much uh, for those answers. Somebody wants to clarify um, your views on um, when it comes to something like Searle's non reductive physicalism, some kind of like uh, biological physicalism, or I can't remember how he puts it. So basically, do you think that's a more defensible version uh, and something that you think that most monists should stick to? I, I, I do not pretend to understand Searle's position. I have never understood his position. Um, it literally doesn't make sense to me. That is. Um, so what I remember uh, especially uh, is is the phrase he used once, where he said the the brain secretes intentionality the way the liver secretes bile. Um, and it, it, just what I mean by using metaphors. <laughs> uh, what does that mean? How do you secrete? I mean, what, what does it mean that it, that there's the brain is actually causing intentionality uh, and that that makes it physical. I, I literally have no idea what he means by that. So it seems to me it, it's, it strikes me as a position that is where the description of it just falls apart when you really shine a light on it. I just don't know what it amounts to. I understand what it would mean to say that there's um, a kind of basic property in nature. Let's say it's intentionality. Let's say it's the property of representing a spatial relation or something like that. And I understand what it would mean for a property dualist to say there's this meant there's this neural structure which has lots and lots of physical properties, and it also has an, an, a non-physical property that is, because it's fundamental and not realized in the physical, of representing um, to the right of, or something like that. Um, I understand what that means. Now, I, there are all kinds of epistemic questions about how you would, how you can ever know about such properties and what's their causal role and blah, 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 blah. But I, I get it. I get it. Yes. It, there's this thing. The state has all these properties and then it has this one, too. I also understand when it says, no, no, no. The representing that spatial relation is something that is realized in a whole a host of causal relations that the state in question has with other states inside the brain and with uh, spatial layout configurations in the outside world. I understand that. This Searle third alternative, I, I don't know. I just don't know what it means. 
All right, wonderful. And Billy had a follow-up question, I think. Um, okay, you talked about Searle. Uh, one of the most uh, controversial and yet uh, revered philosophers of mind has been uh, Professor Daniel Bennett. Uh, first of all, how well acquainted are you with his works? And second, what's your take on his contributions to the philosophy of mind? Uh, thank you. Dan Dennett, is that what you said? Yes, yes, correct. Yeah, oh. Oh, well, I mean, I, I have not read recent work that much, though. When I was in graduate school, I was in a study group with Dan Dennett and um, other people. And uh, I mean, he was a professor by then. He was at Tufts. And so I've known Dan for, um, oh, God, 45 years. Anyway, um, um, and I actually have written. Uh, I've written uh, a couple of things on... Um, in opposition to his views of consciousness. So I, I don't accept his views. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's always, a, I found, I've always found Dennett a little hard to, in, in general, his view of the mental a little hard to pin down because I'm never sure how realist he is or how instrumentalist he is in, in general. But if I think about things like the book Consciousness Explained, is that the title of it? I think that is. I'm, I don't remember proper names as well as I used to. Um, but if I think about books like that, where I, I believe he was being, and he had the multiple drafts model um, of, uh, of consciousness, I think in the end that, I mean, there are lots of interesting and insightful details about what he says and how he differs from others. But in terms of the sort of broad picture on the mind-body problem, I think of that as a largely reductionist picture, not so much eliminate. Sometimes he sounds like he could be an eliminate to this, but, but I think of that as a reductionist picture, which essentially reduces conscious experience to mental representation. And it's a, a kind of version of representationalism. And, um, and yeah, I don't accept that. I don't think it accounts for, um, for lots of important features of phenomenal properties. But I recognize it as, you know, one of the main uh, and important uh, views out there. And uh, given the overall metaphysical plausibility of physicalism, um, I applaud his and others' attempts to make it seem intuitively acceptable. Um, it's just never actually struck me that way. I see. That's great. So, uh, uh... Dr. Levine, we've been going just over an hour. Uh, let us know, do you feel like taking a couple more questions, or do you think we're about to wrap up? How, how do you feel? Um, well, I could take one more. All right. Uh, let's boil down to our last question, and then we will wrap up. So I don't think there was a voice question, though I guess I missed many. So, yeah, this is uh, one interesting question that comes down. So basically, when uh, reading some of the works uh, such as you put forward and some other critics of identity theory, uh, people feel a little frustrated that there is no knockdown argument, you know, something that they could run really quickly. Um, but if you were to pick like one argument that um, you would consider the most straightforward and most undermining for identity theory, uh, which one would it be? Well, it'd have to be my own, of course. Um, uh, um, I, yeah, I, so, I, look, I don't, I don't think there's any neat, simple refutation of materialism. There isn't. It, 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 um, it just, unfortunately, philosophy is just too messy. Um, the kind of argument that I have tried, that I recently have tried to make, which distinguishes me, say, from Chalmers to, uh, to a large extent, even though the hard problem and the explanatory gap are very closely related. I mean, uh, um, I'd say basically the same thing is I would argue as follows. Um, the uh, identity of uh, all other sorts of theoretical identities that we know of, you know, of the normal sort, the heat equals motion of molecules, water equals H2O, lightning is electrical discharge, blah, 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 blah. Um, none of those leave a kind, I mean, 
I know Schaffer disagrees about this a bit. But anyway, none of those leave a kind of explanatory gap that is left by the attempt to identify um, conscious states with um, either functional or physical states. Um, the existence of that explanatory gap is not itself a direct refutation of the of the actual claim of identity. It could there could be identities that are true, even though we can't quite see how they could be true. Right. And I used to really insist on this. There's the metaphysical question of whether the idea is true. And then there's the epistemological question of being able to make intelligible to ourselves what that how that identity really could be true. I now have taken that just a step further and saying, look, let's apply the method of inference of the best explanation. Isn't the best explanation of there being this explanatory gap? the claim that the mental really is fundamental, that would explain why there's this explanatory gap. And whereas if materialism is true, we're left not in understanding why there's this explanatory gap. So as it were, explanation comes in here in two ways. You first cite the presence of this explanatory gap between the mental and, uh, and the physical, and then you appeal to what would explain that gap and if dualism is the better explanation of it, then uh, it gives you more reason to believe it than um, its alternative. However, notice that any this is a kind of abductive argument, so therefore it doesn't establish its conclusion with quite the same force that other sorts of versions of the conceivability argument try to do, where they really try to show that it, that the dualistic conclusion literally follows deductively from the appropriate premises, whereas I'm saying, no, it's really only an abductive argument. All right, and uh, that concludes our Q&A session. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Levine, uh, for taking your time to uh, so graciously um, be our guest. It was super enjoyable for all of us. We simply hope that the feeling is mutual. Um, uh, yeah, no, I had a great time. These are great yeah. questions. Thank you. Yes, uh, everybody shares the sentiment as far as I can tell. So, uh, Dr. Levine, just to make it clear, you were like completely happy with the event, how it went. Um, yes, yeah, no, that is fine. Uh, other than right. the little technical glitches, that yeah, get in, <laughs> that's, that, that's almost like a rite of passage. Here. <laughs> that happens often. No, I know. Yeah. I've been yeah. in enough Zoom meetings, so I know. Yes, it happens, you know. All right. Well, again, thank you so much. Uh, the event will be uploaded and then dissected. In fact, we're going to split it up into parts and not only upload the whole, but upload the parts. Uh, and hope everybody will make sure to check it out. Uh, once again, thank you. We won't take any more of your time. Uh, take care, Dr. Levine. Okay, well, thank you very much. Take care. All right, bye now.